My name is Jean Bancroft and I'm a member of the League of Women Voters of Johnson County. Our timekeeper for today is Mary Jo Langhorn, also a League member. The League is dedicated to educating voters on political and ballot issues. We encourage informed citizen participation in our government. Membership, membership is open to persons age 16 and older. We invite you to join us. Membership information is available at our website, lwvjc.org. Our plan for the day is brief remarks from each of our guest legislators, then questions from the sponsors of today's forum, followed by questions from the audience via the chat feature of Zoom. Today's forum focuses on issues related to social justice. Co-sponsors for today are the Hawkeye chapter of the ACLU, Johnson County Affordable Housing Coalition, Iowa Shares, and Johnson County Interfaith Coalition. I would like to introduce our legislators and legislators, feel free to give a wave to our audience. Senator Joe Balcom, District 43, Senator Kevin Kinney, District 39, Senator Zach Walls, District 37, Representative Mary Masher, District 86, Representative Dave Jacoby, District 74, and Representative Christina Bohannon, District 85. Uh, Bobby Kaufman, District 73, and Amy Nielsen, District 77, are unable to join us this morning. We will start the forum with three minute summaries from each of our legislators on current legislative matters of interest to them individually, starting with Senator Bolcom, just representing District 43. Senator Bolcom. Thank you, Jean. Good morning, everybody. Uh, let me start by thanking the league and all the co-sponsoring groups this morning for bringing us together to talk about the update on the session and hear from you about the issues that you still hope that we can make progress on this year. Um, the session has been a rough one. We're in week 11. Um, if I were gonna select a few words to characterize it, it would be grievance, resentment, and fear. The agenda that has made the most news, if you will, we've taken up bills that decre decrease the ability of people to participate in our elections. Uh, we've tried to censor big tech companies because they kicked Donald Trump off Twitter. Uh, we have bills, even though nobody's talking about defunding the police, to penalize communities for defunding the police. Legislation that increases penalties on protesters, uh, private school vouchers. We passed a bill, no more background checks on gun, on handgun purchases. Uh, we're going to have a constitutional amendment to ban abortion, constitutional amendment on guns, uh, a, whole, a whole host of bills on free speech, and this, that kind of emanates from the, uh, any discussion of racial equality in Iowa, um, and then, of course, uh, numerous attacks on higher education. So it's been a rough year. We've just kind of been fighting a whole host of issues that um, have really been at the forefront of, of, the, of our work. Um, we now turn our attention, uh, in addition to all these policy ideas, to the state budget. Uh, last week, we got new budget estimates, and the state actually is in a pretty good financial position. We have money if we choose to spend it. We're, we're operating with some folks that are very stingy uh, and don't want to spend any money basically on anything. One of the issues that I want to bring your attention to is a tax bill that's going through the Iowa Senate that will uh, phase out the backfill. That has been money that the state has given to cities and counties and schools as a result of the commercial property tax uh, uh, reduction we did in 2013. That's proposed to go away. It, it's a $1.5 million hit to the city of Iowa City, for example, in services. And the other major piece of that is the, the Des Moines takeover of our mental health system. Uh, currently, we have a mental health system that's funded and managed and directed by local leaders. And the, and the, and the Republicans are proposing that Des Moines take over the mental health system and fund it with unreliable and unpredictable state resources. I'm, I'm gravely concerned about this change. It's, it's contained in a very large tax bill uh, that's coming to the Senate this week that'll be sent over to the House with the Senate Republican priorities. 
So I just want to direct your attention to that. Uh, thank you for being here this morning. I look forward to your questions. Thank you, Senator Bolcom. Uh, Senator Kevin Kinney from District 39. Hi. Uh, it's great to see everybody here this morning. Uh, thank you to the League and Gene. Uh, I, uh, I serve on the Judiciary Committee, and one of the things that I've been working on uh, for the last couple of years uh, are going over to the House. Um, Senate File 522, uh, this is a bill that uh, it's an oil, older Iowa uh, legislation that uh, cracks down on uh, people uh, who are scamming elderly people. Uh, the, they are also abusing them and it's, uh, and it's, uh, bringing those penalties, uh, to where I feel that they, they should be. Uh, there's a lot of people that have been, uh, preying on our, our elderly. I'd seen it a lot at the sheriff's office when I was in the investigations division. And it was something that, uh, uh, I'm, I'm glad we've got it out of the house and over the Senate, another bill, uh, Senate file. Uh, 450 uh, is another bill which if you intentionally or recklessly um, harm an older Iowan uh, one of the uh, one of the things you uh, you cannot charge them with is, is a homicide uh, you know, we had that occur here in Johnson County and uh, we're, we're changing this so uh, if someone, intentionally does something like this to uh, someone, they could be charged with a homicide. And then one of the other bills, Senate file 572, is extending the statute of limitations uh, for sexual abuse uh, on children. Uh, again, this is something that I worked a, a lot with and uh, hopefully the House will pick it up and and uh, be able to get it passed and sent to the governor. And then the last bill, uh, Senate File 243, uh, which is we've been named Noah's bill, uh, has passed out of the Senate and is over in the House and has been assigned a subcommittee. And I've been talking with uh, Representative Jacoby about this uh, as we have both been working on this bill. Uh, this is a bill that require someone to report if someone is injured uh, or has been killed and it enhances the penalty if they're trying to cover up a um, another crime in which they committed. Uh, I look forward to hearing from everybody uh, and uh, answering your questions. Thank you, Senator Kinney. And now let's go to Senator Zach Walls. Good morning, everybody, and, and thanks again to the League for hosting the conversation this morning. Uh, I'm Senator Zach Walls, uh, live in Coralville, represent the west side of Iowa City, all of Coralville, rural Johnson County, uh, going up to Solon, and then over uh, to Cedar County, uh, and down to the town of Wilton in uh, Muscatine County. Um, it's It's been, uh, as I think both Senator Volkman and Senator Kinney uh, mentioned, a, a rough couple months. Um, and we're, we're going to kind of be in the, entering the home stretch here as we get into April. It's been, I think, frustrating, not just because of what the legislature <clears throat> has done, but also what the legislature hasn't done. Uh, Senate Democrats and House Democrats came together to introduce more than two dozen different pieces of legislation addressing COVID-19 and the global pandemic that we're still in. I know that many people are starting to get vaccinated, uh, but we're not out of the woods yet. And in fact, over the last few weeks, we started to see the positivity rate and hospitalization rate tick up here in, in our part of the state. So we've got a ways to go. Um, unfortunately, of the two dozen or more bills that, that we've introduced, Republicans have basically um, put their heads in the sand and are acting like this pandemic is over. Uh, they're, they're acting like that both personally at the Capitol where very few Republicans are wearing masks, even though we're working indoors, often in small spaces for extended periods of time. And then they're also not moving, not even giving hearings to you know, virtually any of the bills that we've introduced uh, to, to actually try and, and get this pandemic under control and to help the folks who have been hurt 
uh, economically by uh, the fallout. Thankfully, uh, President Biden and Representative Cindy Axney have done a terrific job at the federal level of, of putting together and passing the American Rescue Plan, or the ARP. Uh, the ARP is going to give more than about $1.4 billion directly to the state of Iowa. It will provide funds to cities, counties, schools across the state of Iowa to help uh, make the necessary investments that they need to make it through this difficult time. And that's going to be a really important part of us bringing the pandemic to its, its end and really starting to rebuild. So I, I want to just give, uh, I know that we've got a lot of bad news coming from the state house here in Iowa, uh, but there is a lot of good news coming down from the federal level. And I want to take just a moment to, to recognize what's happening at the federal level. Um, we certainly know that there are plenty of challenges ahead, both here in Iowa and across the country. Uh, but you know, the, and, and I'm sure that we'll get into some more discussion here about what's been happening at the state house, but um, that is one thing that I'm, I'm really, really grateful for. Um, the one thing that I would, I would maybe uh, just touch on, uh, Joe mentioned it earlier, you know, this week we, the Iowa Senate <clears throat> passed a bill that came over to us from the Iowa house that is going to gut Iowa's background check system for handgun purchases. Uh, this was something that was incredibly troubling. Uh, Iowa's current background check system has uh, blocked 15,000 sales over the last uh, 20 years since that system was put into place. Uh, Republicans seem to think that that's a problem, uh, which is why they're getting rid of it. So I see I've got the stop sign up, so I'll go ahead and, and wind it down there. But it's it's definitely something that we're all really troubled by, and, uh, and we feel it's going to move the state in the wrong direction. Thank you, Senator Walls. And now let's move to Representative Mary Masher, <clears throat> excuse me, from District 86. Mary? Good morning, everyone. And thank you, Jean. Um, thank you all the co-sponsors. Uh, we really appreciate you coming to these. Um, even if they're via Zoom, we're looking forward to being with you in person, um, hopefully next year. Uh, but it's been a challenging year <clears throat> on so many levels. Um, this week, we passed a charter school bill that allows new charters in Iowa. Um, Iowa currently has a charter school bill that, or excuse me, language in the code that allows charters for public schools and is basically governed by the school board. And there's a whole chapter in the code that allows that. And um, quite frankly, our schools are doing some pretty amazing, innovative things. Um, without whole, a lot of funding to support them. Um, this new charter system would be no oversight from the school board. And that was our biggest opposition to it. Um, this would have actually allow a founders group to start a charter in your district um, with people who don't even live in the district. They have to be live in Iowa, but they would not necessarily have to live in the school district that you re reside in, which we felt was problematic to begin with. They also allow that founders group to be able to make money off of uh, that particular kind of school. Um, the founders group could be a part of their governing group um, and they're not elected. So again, you're running into a situation where there's no oversight, no transparency with their budget, our school districts have a whole section of code that tells the public, you have a right to know how your tax dollars are being spent. This will not have any of that. And again, it seems like public tax dollars should go towards public schools. And these are definitely not public schools. Um, they can appeal and basically fill out an application to the state board and that would be approved. <clears throat> So we have enormous concerns about that and that now that bill now goes to the Senate. They had already passed a much larger bill that included both vouchers and charter schools and a whole lot of other things that were unacceptable to the House. And so we're hoping that that bill goes nowhere. Um, the elections bill is one that is a technical bill that is coming back to us uh, from the Senate. And we're hoping we can improve on that particular piece of legislation by allowing more of the satellite sites. Um, no, there, right now, there are a whole lots of restrictions on those. And also, who can pick up a person's ballot at home and also the provisional ballots. The way the bill that they had done earlier was written, 
provisional ballot would not be allowed and um, with the sure vote, no ballots would count after election day. So we have a lot to talk about and I'm looking forward to your questions today and thank you for being here. Thank you, Representative Masher. And now let's move to Representative Jacoby. Well, good morning and as always, thank you for the forum. Uh, actually, I'd like to take just five seconds uh, a moment of silence for our two people in the prison that were killed, our, the nurse and the correctional officer. Uh, so please, just five seconds of silence. Thank you. I think it's very important to recognize these two people who served our communities so well. And quite frankly, in my opinion, uh, when you weaken chapter 20, uh, you lose the input from workers on the situation in the places where you work. Uh, thank you, Kevin Kinney, uh, Senator Kinney, for all your work on Senate file 243. We hope to get that moving in the House. Also in the House, we're working on a piece that the Senate has done on inheritance tax. And I think we're, we've been a little overdue to uh, uh, reform our system on inheritance tax, especially for people who are seeing small amounts of money passed uh, between family members and having to deal, <clears throat> excuse me, with a complicated system and also pay tax on smaller amounts of money. Uh, I do have to say in a little bit of a family bragging, but a little family sadness, uh, very proud of my oldest daughter who had a uh, paper published uh, on breast cancer for the medical schools, combination of the University of Iowa and Vanderbilt. And I'm also very proud of the youngest daughter, Anna, who's updated her graduation date and now looking at graduation her grad school experiences. And I don't bring them up to brag about it. Well, I kind of do. But what I bring them up for is the fact that neither one of them now have plans to return or stay in Iowa due to what we're doing at the state legislature. And one of them is not only what we've done in terms of restricting women's rights, but voting. When you get to a place where you're blocking people from voting, it's hard to live in a community where you don't think your voice is being heard. I'm also working on taxes. And that's uh, just so you know, your state taxes will not be due until June 1st, but I don't want Iowa to become the state of amended returns. And so we're working to make sure that unemployment and uh, the stimulus checks are not taxed in the, by the state of Iowa, but don't count on that because it's not a done deal yet. I look forward to your questions today. Thank you, Representative Jacoby. And now uh, could we hear from Representative Christina Bohannon from District 85. Good morning, everybody. Uh, thank you for being here. Um, I represent uh, Iowa City, sort of the north and east parts of Iowa City, uh, District 85. Um, so I, it's been a very busy session, as everyone has said. Uh, just mention a few things that I've already worked on, and then I'll talk about some stuff currently going on. So. Uh, I worked on the election bill, or I should say against the election bill, as Representative Masher uh, mentioned, uh, as well as the, uh, the bill on the divisive concepts, which essentially was um, a, a state version of Trump's executive order prohibiting certain kinds of uh, racial justice training. Uh, and so uh, I think that that's really a problematic bill and will set us back in terms of um, you know, what we can do with diversity training at universities and schools. Uh, the permitless carry bill uh, that Senator Walls mentioned uh, was something that I, I worked really hard on. Uh, this is a um, this is a really really problematic bill. I mean, this bill is going to eliminate background checks for a very large category of of gun sales. Uh, it is going to make it uh, way more difficult for law enforcement to intervene when there's someone with a gun, say in public or something like that. They used to be able to ask for a permit. They're not going to be able to do that anymore because a permit isn't required anymore for a lot of a lot of people carrying. Um, it actually allows guns on school buses with for people, again, who haven't gotten a permit or a background check. Uh, it expands the people who can have that on a school bus in a confined space with kids. 
Uh, and, and again, that person doesn't have to have a, a, a background check or permit. Um, and so, uh, you know, it, it, it's going to make it a lot easier for felons, for um, uh, people with mental illness, people uh, who have committed domestic abuse offenses uh, to get uh, to get firearms. Uh, this will be the first time in 40 years that the uh, state of Iowa will not have some kind of required permit. Uh, and, and so uh, that sits on the governor's desk. So please, by all means, uh, contact her, put the pressure on to uh, not sign this bill. Um, Senator Walls and I participated in a in every town uh, uh, press conference the other day um, to uh, advocate for the for the governor not to sign this bill. Um, quickly, um, I'm working on the elder abuse bill that Senator Kenny mentioned. Uh, I'm I'm hopeful that we'll be able to do something with that. I think it's a really important bill. Uh, there are some things to do on it, but I think that's that's a really good bill. Um, the other one that I'm really concerned about is uh, in, uh, the upcoming police bills. Uh, one of them coming forward probably this week creates um, probably too much immunity for uh, officers who have been um, who are being investigated for wrongdoing. I had a conversation with a police chief just the other day who think that they go too far in protecting the officers from uh, wrongdoing. I'm also continuing to work on the bottle bill. Uh, I was hopeful at one point that we were seeing some change on that, maybe some um, ability to increase the handling fee uh, by one cent. Um, I don't know where that stands. I talked to the representative who is chairing that and uh, she said that she had a meeting coming up. And so um, I'm going to check back in with her again this week to uh, to see whether there's been any movement on that. I would really like to see an increase in the handling fee so that we can get more redemption centers closer to where uh, those bottles and other uh, uh, containers need to be redeemed. So thank you very much. I look forward to the conversation. Thank you, Representative Bohannon, <clears throat> and thank you all for your updates on legislative issues today. At this time, we will be doing questions, starting with one from the lead and then one from each co-sponsor. Once we have completed those questions, we will turn to questions from members of the audience via the chat feature in Zoom. We remind all participants that questions are limited to one minute. You have one minute to pose your question. Please observe this time limit so that legislators can address as many questions as we can. Legislators, please limit your responses to two minutes. All legislators are welcome to join in responding to each question. So legislators, I ask that if you would like to respond to a question, please use the raise hand function in the Zoom located in the reactions button on your screen. This will allow us to move efficiently through our questions. <clears throat> So the question from the league is as follows. Politicians and housing advocates agree that a lack of affordable housing is an issue in the state of Iowa. Governor Reynolds commended cities in her 2021 State of the State Address that it created affordable housing apartment complexes. Yet Senate File 252 passed the House 56 to 38, and if approved by the Senate with the House Amendment, landlords could choose not to rent to tenants who pay with federal housing vouchers. Please speak to your involvement in the debate on this bill and do you think Governor Reynolds will sign the bill? Well, uh, Representative Masher, would you like to start? Sure. Um, obviously, all of our Democratic representatives uh, fought against this and uh, not only fought against it on the floor during debate, but they also fought against it um, in committee and uh, in subcommittee. And obviously, we see this as a step backwards in terms of our ability in Iowa City. There's three communities, uh, Des Moines, Marion, and Iowa City, that were the ones that had um, ordinances that basically required landlords to uh, take Section 8 housing. And we believe that that was important in our local community because um, our landlords are able to, to rent to many students. And obviously, it makes it very difficult in our communities to be able to find housing for low-income families. And obviously, they still have to go through, um, the landlord could deny somebody because of a background check or because of uh, they obviously have tools that they can still deny someone. So it wasn't as if that was not allowed. But we felt it was really discriminatory 
and extremely um, damning to have the ability to say no to someone just because they're on Section 8. And obviously, we did everything we could to fight that bill. It's over in the Senate now. We're hoping they'll do the same. Thank you, Mary. Um, Senator Bolcom, would you like to speak on that question? Yeah, just briefly. Representative Masher did a good job of the summary. I mean, it's it's tar it targets people with disabilities, people of color, seniors that rely on these these vouchers for safe housing, and it seemed like an uh, it seemed like an issue that really didn't need the attention of the legislature. We have three communities doing it. Um, again, just kind of more grievance grievance policy stuff that they had, you know. Most of the people that voted for this bill have no, you know, they live in rural districts, the biggest community in their districts, 5,000 or 10,000 people, you know, they just don't get it in terms of the, the housing crunch in, in our metro areas and why these vouchers need to be uh, used by people and taken by landlords. It, the Landlord Association is driving this. I mean, it was their bill. And uh, we'll continue to fight it. I'm, the prospects for it passing and being signed are probably pretty good. Thank you, Senator Bolcom. And we will now move to questions from our co-sponsors today. Um, the first question comes from the Hawkeye chapter of the ACLU. And Martha Hampel will um, pose the question for that organization. Martha? Hi, thank you. Um, thank you all for being here thank, um, to our legislators and thank you to the League of Women Voters for having us. Um, my question is concerning Senate File 516, the uh, ban on traffic surveillance and traffic cameras. Um, in many, in many cities, we've seen that traffic cameras increase rear end collisions. Um, Financially speaking, they disproportionately and negatively impact low income and disadvantaged populations. Uh, there's also due process issues because of tickets uh, going to the owners of the vehicle and not the driver. Um, that's quite common in college towns like Iowa City. Um, we know that non-punitive measures are much more effective in reducing speeding and red light running such as uh, extending the yellow light time at an intersection, um, and there's various road engineering that can be done to reduce speeding. Um, so I, my question is, um, how have you and how do you intend to um, vote on <clears throat> Senate File 516 and, and what is your reasoning um, for your decision? Well, this, this is Kevin Kinney. I, uh, I support this legislation because I've had to stand out there and sit on the interstate where you're trying to slow down traffic, uh, especially, and I know that there's an exemption for the, the five and one bridge in Cedar Rapids. Uh, I had to go up to Cedar Rapids to assist them uh, in accidents on that uh, uh, stretch of the interstate and the, the, uh, the safety for the officers out there, uh, you can't, it's, it's almost impossible to sit there and try to run stationary radar or moving radar on uh, that uh, portion of the interstate. I know that they've got the same problem on the uh, west side of Des Moines uh, and when you are trying to pull over cars in areas such as that, uh, you are causing secondary accidents. Uh, and uh, it's, it's almost impossible to do. Uh, that's why I'm in support of this bill. Thank you, Senator Kinney. Uh, Representative Jacoby, would you like to speak on this one? Oh, thank you. Well. Uh, I, I may have gotten a ticket in Cedar Rapids going over the multiple bridges. And in fact, I might have been mad enough to say, you know what, I'm going to fight this. And then I saw the picture with my two dogs in the back seat. I said, well, I probably am not going to fight this. Those do look like my dogs and it looks like my car. My problem with traffic cameras is I actually think that they work 
but I have a big problem with the fines, how much the fines are, and quite frankly, the way they're collected. So it's one thing if there's it's uniform and it's a $25 uh, civil fine and does it work slowing traffic, especially through Cedar Rapids. I do not think it's a reason as they've done in the past to hold people's Iowa income tax returns. And that's what they've done. They've held them and held them for months, not just a week, not just to take out the $25, but the process, I talked to a local person, Coralville woman, who had her income tax return held up for four months and her return was about $1,200, which is significant to her and her family. So that's where my wrestling match is with uh, the traffic cameras are the amount the fines are and how they're collected. Thank you, Representative Jacoby. And Senator Bolcom, would you like to weigh in on yeah, this? Yeah, let me take a swing at this one. This, this is a, this is, there's a few issues in the legislature. This one just keeps coming back to us that uh, are, there are good arguments on both sides. I, I appreciate the civil liberty concerns about it. Uh, I think there, these cameras are predatory. Um, I think there's due process questions, um, but I also am sympathetic to the, the safety um, element that I think has been demonstrated. Um, and, I've, and I've got constituents in, in Iowa City that are passion, very passionate on both sides of this issue. Um, so I've actually, I, I've actually been, on, I've, I've voted to support cameras and I've, I've also voted to take them out. I mean, I've, I've, this bill's been around there like every year for the last 10 years. So I've had a, had a chance to be on both sides of this issue um, as, as people make arguments about it. My thinking has changed. I'm leaning more towards uh, supporting, uh, keeping the cameras um, at this point. Uh, and they say about this job, it'd be a great job if you never had to vote. Thank you, Senator Bolcom. Uh, Representative Bohannon. Hi, thanks. Um, yeah, I, I, I want to agree with Senator Volcom. This is one of those issues where there really are good arguments on both sides. I mean, I can absolutely see reasonable people disagreeing about this. Um, you know, one of my concerns is uh, the uh, decreasing interactions with the police. Uh, I think that uh, we have seen problems with people of color, especially being pulled over. And then what happens is that something escalates there, there's fear uh, on, on either side and something, you know, it, it just gets worse. It gets out of hand. So something that started as a routine traffic stop becomes violent. Uh, and, uh, you know, I, I really think we need to avoid that. On the other hand, I really do understand what you're saying about how this, you know, disproportionately, disproportionately affects low income people and, uh, and, and can be a little creepy, I'll, I'll, I'll admit, <laughs> um, be watched uh, all the time when you're on, when you're on the road. So um, I am still thinking about this. Uh, as Senator Bolcom said, I have constituents on both sides of this issue. I wanna think through it carefully. I would welcome, if you wanna send me more information about this, um, some of the data maybe that you had mentioned or something, I would uh, absolutely commit to uh, looking at that carefully. But I, I do think that there are some really good arguments on both sides of this. And so uh, it's gonna be a tough one. Thank you, Representative Bohannon. Uh, Senator Kinney. Uh, there's only, there's one other thing that's kind of interesting. This was the first bill that actually goes in and defunds the police. That's where we argued on the floor that there's over $3 million that uh, the city of Des Moines for uh, just their share of it would, would lose in uh, funding. Be I, whether you agree with the funding stream going back to the cities or, or to the, the police department, but uh, this is it's really the first uh, and only bill that we've had that uh, defunds the police. Thank you, Senator Kinney and Senator Walls. Yeah, I just, very, very briefly. So um, Senator Kinney just raised a really good point, which is that um, when, when we had our debate on the floor a few weeks ago about some of these <clears throat> defund the police bills, we actually offered an amendment to clarify that uh, cities that use traffic cameras would not be penalized if if um, they saw a decline in revenue or if the legislature stepped in and took those cameras away. 
I, I would, there was a, a comment in the chat here that, that I agree with, you know, I do think traffic cameras do have the intended effect most of the time, you know, the yes curve in Cedar Rapids, uh, maybe representative Jacoby aside, you know, I think typically very effective those cameras being there, you know, catching people or encouraging people to slow down. Uh, they, they do tend to work pretty well. You know, I, I would echo the, the comments earlier. There are good you know, thoughts on, on both sides of this. Uh, but when it comes to, you know, the impact on, on municipal um, budgets and, and the way that those funds are used, the fact that the legislature, you know, can't see how these issues are all connected um, is really frustrating for, for those of us who are in the minority. And, and um, ultimately, the majority is going to decide whether or not this bill is going to come to the floor. Um, this next Friday is what's called the second funnel. And so for legislation that doesn't have to do with taxes or, or, uh, uh, the budget to, to work on. Um, you've got to get that bill out of the, the full committee by, by next Friday. So I think we're only doing one day of debate next week in the Senate. So it'll be a long day, but I, I don't know if we'll have this bill on it yet. So we'll see. And Dave, I just saw your comment in the chat. I, sorry if I misinterpreted it earlier. It's definitely the, the 380 one that I, I certainly know from personal experience. And I think everybody who's driven on that S curve knows how important it is to, to be careful when you're going around that. Thank you, Senator Walls. Uh, we'll now move to a question from our next um, co-sponsor, the <clears throat> excuse me, Johnson County Affordable Housing Coalition, represented by Sarah Barron. Hi, everyone. Thanks so much to everyone for making this opportunity possible this morning. I'm Sarah Barron. I'm the director of the Johnson County Affordable Housing Coalition. We're focused on education and advocacy that supports um, affordable housing for every resident of our community. I'd like to turn your attention to um, the ongoing discussions about manufactured housing rights in Iowa. Um, we know that this is a topic that the legislature has, has tried to tackle for three sessions running now. Um, we know that Iowa has one of the worst records of all the states um, in offering protections for residents of manufactured housing. Um, and we know that, um, that we have folks on both sides of the aisle who are committed to passing some legislation that addresses some of those concerns. So my question for you, of course, speak to the bill itself, but also strategically thinking, um, I'd like to hear from you about any lessons you think we can learn about the future success for affordable housing legislation and specifically, what are the qualities um, and the broad support needed for bipartisan legislation? Um, not just in this fight for manufactured housing residents, but as we all work together to understand and further um, the importance of affordable housing in Iowa. Gene, I'm, I'm happy to speak to that a little bit. Um, you know, hey, good morning, Sarah. Um, I was sorry that I missed the, the, I think it was the closing meeting of the local manufactured housing task force. Um, as uh, you know, uh, Sarah knows, and I, I think many folks on this call know, I've been working on this issue for uh, about two two years now, um, following the acquisition of several Iowa mobile home communities uh, by an out of state investment firm called Haven Park Capital. And this is still an issue two years later. You know, uh, we saw the, those first acquisitions about two years ago, and it continues to be a really uh, big issue today. In terms of you know why the specific legislation that has been brought forward hasn't moved, the really short answer is that um, Republican leadership in the House and the Senate have not made it a priority and have not let it move forward. Um, it sounds really nefarious, um, but you know that's the blunt truth on the, that issue. Um, now we have seen multiple. Uh, proposals that have gotten strong bipartisan support in both chambers, including this year, uh, I believe Representative Bohannon was on a subcommittee uh, for a bill over in the House that I know got out of subcommittee. It was um, transformed into what's called a shell bill, so a bill that's not expected to be the final, the final bill that would be passed, but that provides a legislative vehicle for continuing to work on this issue as, as the session moves forward. And so there's definitely still a possibility that we'll see uh, something happen this year. In terms of the big picture lessons, you know, I think um, one of the things that's that's interesting is that this is all happening while the governor has also been working on on this kind of larger omnibus affordable housing bill that would um, do a lot of good things. So it wouldn't, in my view, solve the problem entirely, but it would be a step in the right direction. Um, 
but even even there in the Senate, Republicans, when they released their budget targets just uh, over the, the last week here, uh, they didn't include estimates presuming that the governor's housing bill was going to pass, which maybe tells you something about how they're thinking the session's going to wind up. So in terms of the, the big picture lessons, it certainly helps to have a broader base piece of legislation that affects more people, right? We know that there are a lot of Iowans who live in manufactured homes, but uh, there are a lot more people who who don't. It certainly helps to have support from the governor's office, not a guarantee of success, but it helps to move the ball in the right direction. Um, and, you know, frankly, it helps to have uh, lobbyists who are organized and, and can build that bipartisan coalition. Um, that's what's been done around the governor's proposal. Um, and by the way, that's what the Landlords Association has done against the manufactured housing bill. So I know I went a little over time, but this is this is a really big topic. So thanks for bringing it forward, Sarah. Representative Masher, would you like to weigh in on this? I'm sorry, I think Dave was next, but um, I think we were waiting on folks to call on us. Gene, we'll go ahead and start. Um, I am extremely supportive of the manufacturing bill that's trying that we are trying to move through the house. Um, the provisions in it are so reasonable. It's just giving the people who live in those homes some more authority and power so that they are the landlords and the folks who own those parks are not um, basically these little dictators that can choose and um, set their own rules whenever they want. And that's why this bill came forward. Um, we've been working on this for over two years and trying to get something done that really and truly supports these folks who live in these manufactured housing parks. Um, it, I, again, I'm just kind of dumbfounded that we haven't been able to get something done prior to this, but I can tell you that the manufactured housing lobby is very powerful. And I hate to say it, but it's about pack checks and who is paying the bill for the Republicans in their elections. And that's the, the just the god awful truth. And I think we have to put that out there because they've been able to block this year after year after year and they continue to create problems in terms of us getting it passed. Um, the other is the governor does have this initiative. Housing, affordable housing is a very high priority because the business community has told her that. And they are the ones pushing this in terms of, we can't find workers if we can't find affordable housing for them. So we need to get on board um, with supporting some of those initiatives and making sure people have a place to live, a safe place to live. I'll stop there. Thank you, Representative Masher. Uh, Representative Jacoby? Well, this has been uh, three years in the making. Uh, quite frankly, I was hoping that when Ashley Henson moved on, that we'd have a better chance of getting this through the House this year, because uh, she was very, uh, she was a key player in blocking this bill over the previous couple of years. Uh, so far, I've heard bipartisan support. I've also heard bipartisan lip service and Representative Masher hit the nail on the head. We have to do a better job of tying this housing, manufactured housing, all affordable housing to the workers because there seems to be a little deafness when we meet with the, with the area of business people that they need workers and saying that they want affordable housing, but they're not supporting us on this issue. So that's something that we need to do better is connect those two dots. Thank you, Representative Jacoby. Um, Senator Kinney, I think you were in there next. Well, thank you. It, it, this bill is something I've worked on with Zach for the last couple of years that uh, uh, the first year I thought we actually had a chance and Ashley Henson was the, the main player that blocked this. Uh, one of the things and one of the strategies that uh, I've been talking with some people in Des Moines is maybe go, instead of having one large bill next year, we need to start, and if this doesn't go through, we need to start breaking this bill up and having smaller bills come through. And 
and and I think that uh, Dave is uh, is so right that we need to start talking to the business communities about workers. Where are we going to house these workers? What are we going to do with the workers? Because they have to have affordable housing. Um, we'll continue to work on it and hopefully get something passed. Thank you, Senator Kinney. Representative Bohannon. Yeah, thanks. So uh, Senator Walls mentioned uh, the work on, on the committee I was on. You know, it, it was really interesting. I, I, I usually, if, if I'm not pretty comfortable with where a bill is currently, I don't usually vote to advance it, um, even if, you know, I think there's potential. I kind of like to see the final bill. But on this one, you know, it did seem in committee like the Republican leadership, the people who are working on this, really wanted to continue working on it. They didn't want it to die. Um, they wanted to continue to work on it. It seemed like there was genuine um, interest in doing that. And so, uh, you know, I voted for it. I, um, even though it was kind of a shell bill at the time, um, I, um, yeah, I grew up in a mobile home uh, and uh, I have been subject to some of these abusive practices. Uh, so, you know, I, I know what that's like. And so um, I voted to advance it, hoping that there was real interest there. The problem is, I think there's I think there's real interest on some of the Republicans part, but they do not seem willing to push the landlords at all. I mean, I mean, I mean it, you know, if, if if there's any pushback, they just don't seem to be willing to say, hey, you need to do this. Um, and and we've seen this with the manufactured home uh, bill. We've also seen it, you know, for example, I'm working on another bill. I've been working on it for a while now. Uh, to, to represent um, students in Iowa City, university students who uh, essentially their uh, security deposits are being held back from landlords because the landlords are saying that they, um, that they cause damage to the apartments so their security deposits aren't being returned and the students are saying that damage was already there. So all they want is a checklist, a move-in checklist so that things can be uh, marked as they move in so they have a record of that. Uh, that's a very, very reasonable thing to do. Uh, and we could allow local governments to regulate that. If this is really a problem, mostly in university towns, we could have local governments regulate that. And we have just not seen any willingness to push the landlords on this to, to, to uh, or, or you know, any kind of willingness to put into a bill that, that local governments get to decide. They won't even put in there you know, that if either party asks for a checklist, then we should have a checklist. I mean, there's just no willingness to push at all on, uh, on these landlord issues. Thank you, Representative Bohannon. Um, Senator Walls, did you have another comment you wanted to make? I, your hand was up, I wasn't sure. Oh, okay, thank you very much. All right, we will now go to um, a question <clears throat> from the Johnson County Interfaith Coalition represented by Donna Hurst. Uh, Donna, you're on mute, please. Okay, I'm starting over. All right. Uh, I'm Donna Hurst representing the Johnson County Interfaith Coalition called JKIC. JKIC is a coalition of churches and organizations founded to promote racial and social justice. Over the last two years, we have been working to establish a hate crime ordinance in Iowa City, North Liberty, and surrounding communities. Iowa City has passed the hate crime ordinance and North Liberty is making progress toward ratification. I would like to ask the legislators, le legislators present if they would be willing to sponsor or support an amendment adding harassment to Iowa Code Section 729A, the hate crime law. Senator Bolcom, would you like to speak to that one? Yes, I would be happy to do that. I think we, we would all be happy to participate and help move that along. Senator Kinney? Uh, I agree with uh, Senator Bolcom. Just get some 
some language for us or, or get, send me something. I'll look at it and we'll try to get something going. Thank you. Representative Masher. Yes, I support and we'll gladly work on that as well. So thank you for bringing it up, Donna, and uh, we'll do what we can to get that amended. Thank you. And Senator Walls. Yeah. Uh, first of all, Donna, thanks for the um, for bringing that forward. I'd be happy, like everybody else, would be happy to take a look at some some language and and figure out. I mean, the seven. I'm looking at Chapter 729A right here. Um, I see a couple different places where it'd be easy to uh, to, to try and amend that in. Um, in terms of harassment generally, uh, Senator, uh, I think Bolko mentioned in maybe his opening remarks, uh, Republicans are currently trying to. Uh, kind of crack down on on social media platforms that have been in the Republican view censoring conservative speech on on these platforms. Uh, of course, conservatives are not being censored on social media, and in fact, of uh, the ten best performing posts on Facebook yesterday, eight of them were from conservatives. One of them was from Barack Obama, and the tenth one was from Cuteness Overload. Um, we really need more cuteness overload in all of our lives, I think, and less Fox News, but that's just me. Um, but this idea that, that conservatives are being you know, censored on social media is, is ridiculous. And so when we uh, brought this bill forward, uh, we actually brought forward an amendment that would have prevented or that would have made sure that social media platforms were allowed to prevent harassment on their platforms. Uh, Republicans voted that amendment down, unfortunately. Uh, but we feel like it's really important for you know, these social media platforms to be able to to prevent harassment on whether it's Twitter or Facebook or whatever the case may be, because we know that that can be used as a, a really targeted form of, of going after people. And that's not right. Thank you, Senator Walls. Representative Bohannon. Yeah, I'll just say quickly, I'd be happy to take a look at that as well. You know, I, I'm I'm sometimes reluctant to um, add new crimes, uh, you know, because uh, I think we do a lot of that. Um, but this is one where I, I would really be happy to take a look and, and um, see what makes sense. Yep. Thank you. And then we'll move ahead to um, the organization Iowa Shares, represented by Holly Hart. Here. Thank you. Um, yes, I represent Iowa Shares. Uh, Iowa Shares is a federation of a number of nonprofit organizations, uh, and we coordinate uh, workplace charitable fundraising uh, every fall, usually. Uh, organizations work for the environment, civil and human rights, international relations, public health, uh, the arts, housing, family welfare, uh, literacy, and lifelong um, lifelong learning and animal welfare. And I think I said the environment. Um, in trying to come up with a question that I thought would represent a number of our organizations and looking at what's out there, I thought I can't even, um, <laughs> there's so much to, um, to address. I have two areas that I guess I'd be interested in, in hearing uh, comments on either. Uh, one thing that hasn't been brought up yet in this uh, forum uh, were what I think are sometimes referred to as bathroom bills or related bills relating to um, uh, gay, lesbian, bi, uh, transgender individuals. And I know there are a number of bills in, uh, introduced in this legislature, and I believe all or most of them did not pass, but I would be interested to hear uh, an update on that. Um, uh, the other, uh, it has to do with that voter uh, suppression bill. Um, despite the fact that its supporters say that it really uh, makes voting more secure. Iowa actually has a very secure voting system, one of the top in the country and the most one of the most accessible. Also, uh, traditionally, Iowa has been very accessible in allowing participation in things like caucuses and primaries and in being able to both participate as a voter and a candidate. And I'm curious if legislators have noticed one thing I've not heard mentioned in that bill is something that um, in other states where they've adopted such measures are very clearly aimed at internal party control uh, known as sore loser laws. That means if you are a candidate and you run in the Republican or Democratic primary and you lose, you cannot then go ahead to run as an independent in the general election. Uh, those you, laws Holly. where they've been. Uh, thank you, Holly. I'm okay. going to. 
Yeah, let, All right, thank you. let the legislators start to uh, weigh in on those ideas. Thank you so much. Uh, Representative Bohannon. Others were ahead of me uh, in the in the queue there, but um, just the way it shows up on my screen. Okay, no, no problem. I just didn't want to. <laughs> uh, yeah. Yeah. So, um, so just a couple things. Uh, I think that uh, you're absolutely right that there was no need for this election bill. Uh, in fact, uh, unlike in the Senate, uh, the floor manager of the election bill, Representative Bobby Kaufman, admitted on the floor that the election was not stolen, the 2020 election. Uh, did not say that there was widespread fraud. Uh, and so uh, that just begs the question, then why are you doing this? You know, why, why have this law? Um, and um, there really was no evidence whatsoever. Uh, you know, I think we had an incredibly successful election, uh, record turnout, uh, record turnout by mail. Uh, this election bill is going to make that much harder. It just slashed and burned basically, you know, all of the... Um, windows that we had for voting, uh, the options for voting. Uh, and so there really was no, you know, no need for this bill uh, at all. Um, and uh, so, so the, the other thing I'll say just about the transgender issues, um, you're absolutely right. I think that uh, we have seen some bills introduced. You know, what we're seeing with that in, in the House is a lot of things being introduced to sort of make a point. Um, yeah, uh, just a couple days ago, we had one representative who stood up on the floor and said that uh, she wanted to introduce an amendment that would um, prohibit transgender uh, students from um, playing on women's sports teams, uh, saying it was kind of unfair competition for them, even though we've not seen any problems related to that. And then she immediately withdrew the amendment and uh, sat down. And so, so, so she clearly didn't have the votes for that. Uh, but she wanted to make that point. And I think what we're seeing is that there isn't support for that because I think people realize how damaging that would be to the state and how controversial that would be. But they're introducing these bills and making these comments to try to make a point. And I think even that is really damaging uh, to people and sends a very bad message about our state that's going to make uh, the state look like a backwater. So I think that's really problematic in and of itself. Thank you. Uh, Representative Masher. Thanks, and thanks for the question, Holly. Um, Holly, there is such a phobia going on in Des Moines on so many issues. Um, and, and we had conversations in other forums yesterday where um, we've just been really saddened and discouraged um, by the agenda that we're seeing this year. Um, we know transgender people in Iowa are already facing a great deal of discrimination. Um, they have higher suicide rates. You know, we know all of those things. And yet we have this very phobic group in Des Moines that are proposing legislation. And, and basically, um, it's hateful. I, I don't know how else to say it, Holly, other than it's just hateful and so wrong. Um, and Again, those bills aren't going anywhere, but what a terrible message it sends about our state. And I guess those are the things that I wanted just to mention today. Um, we're better than that. And we should be better than that in terms of what we are proposing. Um, on the elections bill, how like, this is the way the Republicans phrase it. We want it to be easy to vote and hard to cheat. Well, number one, we have very little cheating in Iowa, right? We have, there's no evidence of that. And they even did research and, and had a private investigator to try to prove that. There wasn't any. And they're making it harder to vote. And they're doing this nationwide. It's not just here. They believe that's the only way they can win. And isn't that a sad statement? So I'll stop there. Thank, thank you so much, um, Senator Walls. Well, first of all, um, Holly, thanks for the question. You know, thankfully, it, it doesn't seem like any of those bills will be moving forward this year, which is really, obviously, really good news. Um, but, you know, I think the fact that the bills were introduced and got as far as they did, to Representative Masher's point, sends a really difficult and painful message to a group of people who are already dealing with a lot of hardship in their own lives, and to now have people in Des Moines obsessed with like where they go to the bathroom is just really, really awful. 
Um, so we're going to continue to oppose that legislation. We're going to continue to call out that legislation when it's introduced. And we're going to continue to point out to the people of Iowa, there's only one political party in Des Moines that is obsessed with these social cultural issues that are trying to divide and pit Iowans against each other. So we're just going to leave that there. Uh, on the gun piece, you know, look, if, if, go if more firearms made people safer, America would be the safest country in the world. Thank right. They, oh. But they, they don't. So we're not um, on, in the in the way that pertains to the election piece is that for all the quote unquote concerns about voter fraud, if Republicans had one percent of the concern about, you know, mass shootings and firearm deaths in this country that they do about allegations of voter fraud, uh, then maybe they would have dropped a 95 page bill making it harder to purchase a firearm. Right. They don't think it's a problem, which is why they're not concerned with introducing legislation to try and fix it. Uh, and so, you know, in terms of priorities and, and where we're headed, I think it's, you know, I think the, the agendas really speak for themselves. Um, but the election law is, is, is obviously a step backward. And the thing that I, I you know, you'll, the Republicans would get up on the floor and say, well, in Vermont and Massachusetts, the voting numbers are different or the laws are different or whatever. Um, but the thing that is, is always lost in those conversations is that when you change laws in Iowa, you know, we've all heard about this. We're all here. We're spending our Saturday mornings talking about politics. We're all very, right, very politically engaged. Most people have no idea that this law was changed. And so when they, they show up to vote uh, in 2022 and the law is different than it was when they voted most recently or in 2024 because they don't vote in, in midterm elections, I think there's going to be a lot of confusion and a lot of folks who are going to be disenfranchised to solve a problem that, as the bill sponsor in the House admitted, doesn't actually exist. Thank you, Senator Walls. Uh, Representative Jacoby? Thank you. Actually, the election law is the biggest scam I've seen in my tenure at the Iowa State Capitol. And a little different view of the bathroom bills and other bills attacking many people in Iowa. Uh, there is majority support for those bills. Make no mistake, it's the, the reason that they're not progressing is because one or two of the Republican leaders do not wanna deal with it at this time. But I truly believe if it was on the floor of the Iowa House that those stupid bills would pass. I think what we have to keep an eye on, and Senator Walls has mentioned this before, is how we're gonna redistrict this year. And I think that's one of the reasons we saw that election bill is the fear of what those districts may look like after either we or the Supreme Court determine those boundaries. Thank you, Representative Jacoby. So we will now begin to accept questions from the audience. To pose a question, please go to the chat window and type in your question. We will be monitoring the chat and pose your questions to legislators as we receive them. Um, if you are representing an organization, please include that in your question. Legislators have two minutes to respond. Out of respect for all present, please do not interrupt speakers. Let's begin. So this question comes from Cindy Conger. A sub-theme of many bills passed this year seems to be racial discrimination. Back to the blue, anti-diversity training, housing voucher exceptions, new voting bill. Has the legislator moved forward in the work they did last year to support racial justice issues? Okay, Senator Walls? Yeah, the, the answer is no. Um, they, they're, you know, last summer, um, following the death of George Floyd, and I think the outpouring of national support for um, taking another look at public safety in this country, um, you know, we had some bipartisan legislation that moved forward in, in the Iowa legislature. I will say that process was very rushed. Um, we all worked on it. I mean, it was, it came together very, very fast. And so the, that legislation certainly could have done more. Um, it could have had a, a kind of a smoother process, but you know we were back for it's kind of a ten day session uh, because of the the pandemic. Um, that bipartisan spirit, however, has not been present. I don't think in any of of this legislation uh, that was in that list from from Cindy. So uh, the, it's unfortunate. The short answer, the and the answer is uh, no. Uh, instead, I think Republicans see a lot of these as a wedge issue that they can use in campaigns and. 
in fact, that was exactly what we saw in the in the campaign last year, and and I expect a preview of what we'll see in the campaign in 2022. Thank you, um, Senator Bolka. Yeah, this is this has been probably a th one of the major themes I think that's run through the session is the whole issue of will Iowa deal with racial inequality in the aftermath of the. Of the George Floyd's death at the hands of a Minneapolis police officer. Um, as Senator Walls noted, we passed this unanimous bill to do a very basic criminal justice reform around making sure we, we don't have bad cops and we, uh, cops can't choke people to death. And uh, we everybody patted themselves on the back and said, this is the first step. Uh, after all the after all the civil unrest last year, this session has been frankly a backlash to the the call for a, a discussion and reckoning with racial inequality in Iowa. We've had a series of bills: defund the police, more immunity for police, um, uh, more more penalties for protesters, all these bills around so-called free speech and what we can and cannot talk about on campuses as it relates to race. Um, and so it's really, really disappointing. I do think as Senator Wells noted that they figured out that race was a very powerful emotional campaign tool to beat Democrats up with on the whole defund the police with the video of the protesters in the streets. We, we, you know, we got we got lectured about Minneapolis Police Department when we passed the, one of these bills a couple of weeks ago. Minneapolis is in Minnesota. If, if you have geography challenges, um, but I think we, do, we what we do need is a is an honest discussion about how we can address disparities in education, disparities in in income, in wealth, in health, all these issues that are confront. Uh, people of color in our state. And I think the challenge that we have is we have mostly white legislators run, running in districts where they have no, they, they have black constituents, but they have no interaction with people of color and they just simply have no frame of reference. I'm going to benefit of the doubt here to understand these issues, racial profiling, and they have no interest, this is a disappointing part, they really have no interest in discussing or trying to advance their knowledge about it. And in what we are getting are all these like barriers and roadblocks and walls uh, that basically are telling Iowans, quit talking about this, we're, we're, we're not racist, and you better not say we're racist, and by the way, we don't even want, we don't want to talk about it. Although, as Senator Walls noted, we will see defund the police commercials in every campaign in Iowa and for Congress for the foreseeable future run at us by Republicans because they're inciting fear in people. Thank you, Senator Bolcom. Representative Masher. Um, Senator Bolcom hit it on the head. That's exactly what we're dealing with. And um, it's interesting. I don't think the bill we passed last year would pass this year. If it was on the floor for debate and in the Senate, I don't think it would have a prayer because these people have used that fear. And uh, again, they live in very different districts. They know very few minorities. And so they don't care. I, I hate to be that callous, but that's exactly what they are telling us every time they fight anything where we're trying to find common ground on racial issues. They, they are just adamantly opposed to that right now. And they know fear tactics work. Um, they have been very successful for that. You know, nobody was talking about defunding the police um, in Iowa City and a lot of our communities. We talked about diverting resources so we could help the police. Um, Kevin Kinney will tell you they are not psychologists and social workers and counselors. They don't have that skill set, and that's not what they were trained to do. But that's what they're dealing with on a daily basis in their jobs. And so the more that we can do to help them um, do their jobs and basically really focus on what their jobs are uh, and providing more of those social supports, because that's what we're lacking. We don't have good 
particularly the mental health system that's well-funded. We don't have a children's system that's well-funded. Um, we don't have those things in place right now. And again, it's really hurting us as a state. We need to move forward and get those things in place and support our people. And right now that isn't happening. So I'll stop there. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Representative Masher. Uh, Representative Bohannon. Yeah, so, so just re reiterate, um, and I'll, I'll be quick, but uh, I think Senator Welcome's absolutely right that you know what we're seeing now is a backlash to everything that happened last summer. Um, you know, even just the minor steps that, that the legislature took last year, I think that there's a sense that that maybe that shouldn't have happened, uh, that, that, they, that the legislature should not have responded that way, uh, that that was somehow against law enforcement, um, encouraging these these protesters, or a lot of them will call them rioters, you know, um, and uh, and I think that, that we're seeing a backlash and, and, and frankly, just an, an exaggerated backlash and overreaction uh, to, to all of that. And so I think that that's what's happening. And, and, you know, I do think that a lot of this is because they just don't have a lot of minorities in their districts. They don't interact with people on any kind of regular basis. Um, and so they don't see these issues. You know, I, I, I talked on the floor. I, I have uh, students at the university, people of color who have been followed by police all through Iowa City over to their apartment in Coralville, people who have been pulled over multiple times for no reason at all to the point that they started keeping brake light bulbs in their glove compartment uh, because they were afraid of this. Um, you know, we, we have these issues, even in Johnson County, where we think of ourselves as pretty progressive, you know, these, these issues uh, occur. And, um, and so, uh, but, but they just don't, they don't see that. They don't want to see that. I think any suggestion that we have had racism issues in this country is perceived as un-American to say so. Uh, and I think that that's a big part of this. Um, and just to kind of put a final uh, point on it, uh, it's, it's gotten so bad that the bill that's coming over to the House from the Senate about the protesters actually would make it okay for a person to uh, drive negligently or grossly negligently and, and hit a protester and there would be immunity for that. And, and, and that is just, it's sick. It's, it's sick, these are kids mostly. And, and, and they're saying if these kids are in the road and someone drives past and they, even if they're driving negligently or grossly negligently, if they run over them, well, they shouldn't have been there. And that's, I think that that is a shocking, shocking thing. Uh, so that is unfortunately where we are. Gene, if I could add one more comment on this um, area, just, just very briefly. I want to stress law enforcement groups are not asking for these bills. There are three different bills that passed the Iowa Senate, one that expanded qualified immunity and turned it into unqualified immunity for law enforcement officers, another that was aimed at, quote unquote, defunding cities that defund the police, and the third one that Representative Bahannon just spoke to that essentially kind of allows the, the, these new penalties, essentially, or, or kind of vindictive actions against protesters. Of these three bills... I believe only the qualified immunity legislation had any actual registered support from law enforcement groups. And even that came very late in the game. They were not out here pushing this forward and, and trying to get it into the into law, right? Um, so I wanna be very clear with folks. It's not like law enforcement groups are the ones out here pushing these bills forward as a way to try and swing the pendulum back. These are political messaging bills that are designed to be used in campaign commercials. These are not things that law enforcement want or are asking for. There's actually a bill in the House that does have strong uh, support from law enforcement organizations and that I believe has uh, some pretty strong bipartisan support that would actually do uh, things that law enforcement groups are asking for and that they feel like would make it easier for them to do their job. You know, most people on this call have probably not even heard of that bill. Uh, because Republicans have not made that a priority in the same way that they've prioritized these very political, vindictive, um, essentially campaign commercial bills that they're trying to use against Democrats for 2022 and beyond. So, you know, it's 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 incredibly disappointing. Um, you know, there are opportunities to to move our state forward while thinking um, in new ways about how public safety looks in the 21st century. Thinking creatively about how do we close some of these. Uh, disparities or gaps that exist along racial lines. Uh, Republicans have not expressed any interest in doing that. Uh, instead, they're playing politics. 
Thank you, Senator Walls. Uh, Representative Masher. Mary, you're sorry, I forgot to put my hand down. Oh, okay, all right, no, I miss you. That's no problem, <laughs> no problem. <clears throat> all right, um, Leslie Carpenter, who is um, one of our participants today, would like to pose a question about the death penalty bill. Leslie? Good morning, Leslie Carpenter with Iowa Mental Health Advocacy. First, I'd like to say thank you to each and every one of you legislators for all the help that you've been doing um, to help me with moving for bills and moving against bills. I greatly appreciate it. Um, I wanted to bring to your attention, and I'm sure you're already aware that the death penalty bill, the very first bill that had a subcommittee meeting in the Senate this year, was a horrible bill. Um, I spoke to help fight that bill, but unfortunately it's been attached as an amendment to that bill that you were just describing in the House, the anti-protest bill. And I'm wondering about your thoughts on that in terms of advice for fighting against that amendment um, and whether you think that has any legs. This is the, uh, this, they're tying this directly to the, the death in Anamosa, correct, Leslie? This is about the corrections officers who were murdered. Yeah, and I'll let the House speak to that. I, I, I just heard about this uh, yesterday. Um, you know, obviously pretty troubling, you know, to Representative Jacoby's point earlier. I think we were all saddened and shocked by what happened in Anamosa. It's the first time in, I think, like 60 or 70 years that that's happened. Um, yeah, Representative, want to speak to its prospects? Thank you, Representative uh, Bohannon. Yeah, so, you know, one thing that's just kind of interesting about this is I, I worked this session on a, uh, what, what's called a lifer review bill. So this is, this would be um, a, a uh, better review process for people who have been uh, sentenced to life imprisonment. And uh, it, would, it would provide a meaningful opportunity for review after 25 years. Uh, I'm strongly supportive of this bill. Um, and have really tried to push it. It's, it's very, very difficult. Um, but one interesting thing in that conversation is how many of the Republicans in the House would say, we don't want to support this bill because if we think that we, if, if we start saying that life imprisonment doesn't mean life and really mean life imprisonment anymore, that people will bring back the death penalty. That, 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 you know, a lot of the Republicans will say that the reason they're not supporting that is because they need to be able to say that life imprisonment means life imprisonment so that there isn't a move toward bringing back the death penalty. And I've heard that from a number of different uh, representatives. Now, to be honest, I think some of that's a little bit disingenuous. I think some of it is they just don't want to do this life or review bill. And so they're kind of putting that up. But, but they have said it a, a number of times, and I've heard that. Uh, and so I, I'm, I'm hopeful that means that there is not uh, the support for a death penalty bill. Um, and we do have a number of Catholics, frankly, in our in our uh, in the House um, who I think would be opposed to that uh, on principle. Um, and so, you know, I, I'm hopeful that it that it won't move forward. You know, if it's limited in some way to like the the peace officer, the sort of security, you know, those kinds of things. I don't know whether there would be um, any interest in in doing that, but um, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm going to try to remain optimistic for the moment that um, that that will not uh, that that would not pass the House. Thank you, Representative Bohannon, uh, Senator Kinney. Well, when it comes to to life in prison uh, and convicting someone uh, to be in prison for the rest of their life, I probably disagree with you a, a, a little bit. Uh, uh, in, in, in the, some of the, those comments, you know, when I've dealt with victims of, uh, homicide, uh, sexual assault, uh, when you are telling those people that they are going to have to serve the rest of their life in prison for what they did. And you explain to them that, and, and where I came off the, the, the part about, uh, the uh, capital punishment or, or, or uh, death penalty was I went down after Roger Bentley had killed Josetta Gage and after I had put him in prison and seen what he, what and how he had to live uh, in the Fort Madison. Uh, his life to me 
it would have almost been a blessing to uh, to him, I think, if we would have had the, uh, the death penalty. Uh, he was getting out one hour in the middle of the night because they're required to let him out. Uh, and uh, he was not with the other inmates. Uh, and I think we have to stress more of that. And I, th I think that uh, Representative Bohannon's right that they're going to go after that uh, if we start looking at uh, reviewing uh, life sentences. I'm not saying that we can't look at it. Uh, I'm, I'm more than happy to look at it. But uh, uh, I think that there's that very much that possibility. Thank you, Senator Kinney. Uh, Senator, or Representative Bohanna, would you like to make another comment? Yeah. Just a, a rebuttal, <laughs> a rebuttal. Uh, no, you know, I, I, I get I get what Senator Kinney's saying. I mean, I think that, I, I do think that there is that concern and I do think that when victims, you know, are told, hey, this person's gonna go away for life, you don't need to worry about them anymore. You know, I, I think that that's a real, real concern. But what I'll say is that the kind of review that we would be talking about uh, would be very rigorous. I think very few people would actually be let out. We're not talking about letting everybody out who's done these things. We're talking about people who have been truly reformed, who have worked really hard at rehabilitation, who have mentored other uh, inmates, um, who have been, you know, who, who have gotten skills to make something of their lives. And I think that that would be, there would be very few people who would actually get through that. But right now it's almost zero. Um, and, and we actually see very little recidivism in, um, in the few people who, whose sentences have been commuted and, and, and so on. I'd also say that there are victims advocates groups who actually support life or review because they understand that a lot of the people who commit these crimes themselves uh, were advocates and, um, I mean, I'm sorry, were victims of, of, of different kinds of abuse. And so uh, it, it, it's, it's a little more, more complicated and more nuanced. Um, but I, and, 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 you know, if, if, if conditions are so bad in prisons that, uh, that death would be better, then I think maybe we should think about what the conditions are in those prisons. Um, I, I, don't, I don't know that, um, that we should say, you know, they should be sentenced to death because our, our prison system is worth, worse than death. Um, but, um, but, I, but I do appreciate what Senator Kenny is saying. Um, I think that, I, I do think that for some people, uh, some, some Republicans in, in the House um, as I'm saying, that they they would worry about um, about bringing back the death penalty if if we revisit the the life imprisonment. So I, it's definitely something to think about. I'm just saying I'm hopeful that at the moment, given where we are, that 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 means that they're probably not going to support the death penalty. I'll also just add in conversations I've had with some of the Republicans in the House when I say, "Boy, you guys have gotten kind of extreme this year. What's you know what's going on?" Um, they're always, every single time they respond, we're way better than the Republicans in the Senate. And we're stopping a lot of the things that are happening in the Senate. So, uh, so you know, something's always worse, right? Um, and so I'm hoping that this is one of the things that they would not support uh, that came from the Senate um, when it comes over to the House. Thank you, Representative Bohannon. And Rep Senator Walls, did you want to yeah, just, this? just very briefly, I mean, Iowa does have the death penalty. It's called life in prison. You know, so just, I mean, to be very clear, that's what the death penalty in Iowa is. You die in prison. Um, as somebody who has a prison in my district, uh, I've visited that prison multiple times. I've talked with inmates who are going to spend the rest of their lives in that facility uh, and die in that facility. Um, and, you know, I, I appreciate um, Senator Kinney's point and, you know, I, in terms of how the conversations in the public, we'll see what happens with the bill. But, um, you know, the reality is that Iowa does have a death penalty. And so I, I don't think that we should lose sight of that fact um, as we have these conversations uh, and, and we think about kind of where where we go from here. So, so I wanted to make sure that, you know, folks are, are aware that when you talk to inmates who are sentenced to life in prison, they'll tell you Iowa has a death penalty. Thank you, Senator Walls. Um, in the chat, we have a question from Janice Weiner. Uh, one other theme running through this session is rolling back local control, sometimes under the guise of retribution, as with the Des Moines School Board, for example. What are the best ways to counter that? Jean, I'll jump in here. Um, okay. Elect more, elect more Democrats. <laughs> the end of story. Janice, you and I both know that. Um, the people who we have in office right now, 
um, could care less about local control. They talk a good game and they care about it when they want to obviously um, provide more support for local government. But typically we're seeing more and more bills where we're taking away local control. So they don't believe in that really. Um, they hate it. And especially if it's things that our local governments are doing that they don't like. And so it's all about punishing and taking away that authority. So end of story. <laughs> Thank you, Mary. Um, Senator Walls, did you want to speak to that? No, uh, Senator Bolcom. Well, yeah, I mean, with th this group over the last five years of being in control, we've just seen rounds of bills that would allegedly take away the authority of, of local governments to do stuff, whether it's school boards or cities or counties. And, and uh, it's really, when you, when you get right to it, it's really anti-democracy is what we, we should quit calling it local control. It's, it's really anti-democracy because what, what is, you know, they're basically usurping the ability of, of people to make decisions about the welfare of their communities. And they like, con the, the key word here is control. They like control. They, they want to tell everybody what they can say and what they, who they can hang out with, what, what kind of food they should eat, what kind of gas they can put in their car. Um, and it, we had a debate a couple of weeks ago and I used the word autocrat on to refer to my colleagues. And I got, I got called to the well because I used the word autocrat to describe some of the stuff they were doing. I was like, what? So they like control and they like speech, free speech, as long as they are speaking. They don't like it when other people say things that they disagree with or somehow out of their frame. So um, I don't think, I think Representative Masher is right. We, if you want to fix this, you need other people in control of the operation. Thank you, Senator Bolcom. Representative Jacoby. Well, thank you. I think the key word in this session is the word but, B-U-T, just one T, B-U-T, because you will hear, I support education, but, or I support diversity, but I support women's rights, but, and on topic, I support local control, but. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> we have a, another quick question from Diana Henry. She would like to know, um, and I think this is related to a, an earlier response, why doesn't law enforcement be more proactive in letting the public know that they are not pushing these bills? Yeah, um, so Mrs. Henry was my fifth and sixth grade social studies teacher, so it's really great <laughs> to see her on this forum um, and, and really appreciate the question, Mrs. Henry, so thank you. Um, you know, it's, it's a good question, and, and the answer is really simple, which is that they are worried that if they register against these bills, that Republicans will somehow take this punitive action against them and refuse to move the priorities that do have bipartisan support over in the House. And this is Look, it's a political, um, you know, there's a lot of, uh, frankly, ego involved in the majority, you know, where if they register against you, there's kind of a tit for tat thing that happens. Uh, and so I think it's a very, unfortunately, very logical response to the way that the majority is governing right now, which, as we heard a moment ago, vindictive is absolutely the right word to describe it. Uh, and that's, and that's simply... I think why, you know, and it's, by the way, it's not just law enforcement groups where this is the issue. We had Senator Bolka mentioned earlier the, the bill about um, tech companies and social media platforms. I don't think a single one of those companies that was technically registered against the bill. And the reason they weren't registered against the bill was because they were worried that it may result in even further uh, attacks essentially on those companies or on their industry, which, you know, you can maybe have a, a, conver a separate conversation about moral courage. Mrs. Henry, if I'm remembering correctly, once kept a poster in her classroom that read, what is popular is not always right, and what is right is not always popular. And that's something that stuck with me from, from when I was in elementary school. Uh, but there's, you know, I think in terms of the political calculations that these groups are making, uh, that's a, a pretty straightforward, you know. And by the way, um, they're probably, they're being advised to do that by the lobbyists who represent these groups, right? It's not just like 
you had a bunch of a board of directors that's just sitting on their hands. It's that they're taking legislative advice from the people they've hired to give them advice, and that's the advice that they're giving them. Um, Representative Masher. Um, yeah, Diana, thanks for being on this morning, and thanks for all your years in education. Um, if we forget to tell you that, we appreciated it. It was a pleasure to work with you. Um, just, just to let you know, um, the gun bill that we did on basically uh, eliminating permits uh, was one that you would have thought law enforcement, um, both sheriffs and our chief of police and police officers would have been registered adamantly against. They did not. They tried to improve the bill, and Kevin was part of that, I'm sure, in terms of making it better. But at the same time, they feared if they registered in opposition that it would hurt them. And we see that all the time this year, again, with people being threatened and people being fearful of doing the right thing. And I say that because um, I had talked to law enforcement here locally, and they said, well, we'd rather have a seat at the table and try to improve it than be shut out completely and have something that we can't accept at all. And I said, well, the permitting is something that I can't believe you would, it would, would be in support of, and the permitting is so critical in keeping people safer. And to me, that is really a shame. We have people so fearful of registering for or against a bill because of the threats that come about as a result of that. And that's what we're seeing time after time after time. And when we ask them, they just say, you know, uh, we just would rather not become a target. And that's why they do it. So. Uh, and their lobbyists, you're right, their lobbyists are the ones telling them not to. So, end, end of story there. Sorry. Thank, thank you, uh, Representative Masher. Uh, Representative Bohannon? Yeah, so I, I, I was almost going to say exactly the same thing, but I will say that, you know, I, I had a conversation with a police chief um, in the Capitol just uh, maybe a week, a week and a half ago who said that he thought the permitless carry uh, bill would result in more officer involved shootings. He was, he was very clear about that. He also said that he thought the um, upcoming immunity bill would uh, give too much protection for officers uh, under investigation for wrongdoing. Uh, but but it, it, you know, Representative Nasher is, is exactly right. And um, Representative Walls, you know, that um, they think that they can do better by trying to work with the Republicans and maybe tweak the bill Get a few amendments, a little, you know, a few things here and there, than trying to oppose it outright because uh, they are worried about um, about a vindictive response. Uh, and so that's, you know, that's just what it is. And and as Representative Master said, we've had this problem. You know, there have been times when I think our caucus sometimes hasn't even known where uh, a group or lobbyist stands on a given issue because they don't register, and so we're left wondering. <laughs> what what do you actually think about this bill? Because we pay attention to that, you know, and um, and it's been hard. I mean, there have been times I've had to call lobbyists and say, tell me what you think about this bill. I need to know because they're not registering for it. They're not saying, you know, exactly what, what they feel. So uh, it's a really hard situation, um, you know, and I think as Democrats in our caucus, we have to think about that. You know, when do we fight? When do we try to work with them to try to get at least some amendment or some small change um, most of the time this session, I think it's been more fighting because some of the bills have been so bad, but, um, but we do uh, you know, try to look for those opportunities where we can. Thank you, Representative Bohannon. Senator Kinney? So many times uh, people don't realize um, what positions we get put in. There are, there are law enforcement that probably I agree, don't agree with this bill. But uh, when law enforcement comes to you, uh, of course, I've probably got a little different of view on some of these things. They'll come and they'll come to you and go, can you try to make this better? And you're working behind the scenes trying to make this thing better. And sometimes if, and I've done it before, I'll agree to vote for something as long as they'll take some amendments that makes it a little bit more workable, a little bit uh, 
safer for those law enforcement officers and so forth. And um, people don't realize that. And, and they'll ask you sometimes why you voted for something. Well, it's because you're working behind the scenes and have agree, agreed to do something to make try to make something better uh, that you probably don't agree with wholeheartedly. But that, that's it, it's just a different place to work sometimes, and and sometimes you have to make those decisions. Thank you, Senator Kinney. Uh, <clears throat> this uh, I think will be our last question. And this question comes from Linda Schreiber. Speaker Grassley said during Iowa Press yesterday that something will be done with the bottle bill this year, indicating that his grandfather, Senator Chuck Grassley, told him to never do away with this legislation. The Lee helped pass the legislation 40 plus years ago when the emphasis was on litter. Today, the focus is unclaimed deposit money and redemption. Speaker Grassley said the legislature will bring all the groups together to settle this issue. We know the beverage and grocery industries are at the table. Who is representing Iowa consumers? Is there a seat at the table for the league to represent consumers? All right, um, uh, Representative Bohannon. Yes, sure. So I'm, I'm on the subcommittee for this bill. Um, you know, I, I think that there is a possibility that we can still get some movement on this. Uh, the, the, there are, it was really interesting in committee, there were uh, several Republicans who expressed uh, frustration with the interests involved, the grocery stores, with the um, bottle distributor, beer distributors and others um, for not working on this more. And, and, and I, was, I was actually very pleasantly surprised that a number of people were so frustrated uh, with that, and so, um, but but the problem is the person who the uh, the uh, subcommittee chair who's working on this fundamentally doesn't believe in the bottle bill. I mean, she has said publicly that she would probably just get rid of it if it were up to her. So it was an interesting choice of a subcommittee chair for that bill. Uh, but um, but but I do think that I just talked to her two days ago, and I wanted to know what the progress was, and she said that. Uh, that she was supposed to have a meeting with um, the grocery store side and the uh, beer distributor side um, to see if they've come to any kind of agreement. I think what was what they were hoping for was that those two sides would agree to um, a one penny uh, increase in the handling fee so that, um, you know, and, and basically what I'm hearing from the uh, Redemption Center folks is that if they could get to a two and a half cent redemption fee, then that would be doable. That that would be something where where it would make it profitable enough. And so if we if we added one penny, that would get us to two cents. And so we're getting closer. Um, so if if we could if we can get that, I think that that would be useful. I was very happy to hear Senator Grassley. I mean, sorry, uh, uh, Speaker Grassley say what he did. Um, I hope that that means that they will push a little harder uh, these groups to come together. Um, honestly, I don't know who is in the room representing uh, consumer interests on this. I think that right now they're looking at this as a battle between the beer distributors and the, and the grocery stores. And they're thinking that if they can come to an agreement, then that will represent, you know, I, I, that, I think that's faulty reasoning. Uh, I, think, I think consumers need to be more represented. I think at least somebody from the redemption side needs to be uh, at the table, people who really know that business and know what it would take to make that profitable enough to have you know, um, enough of those centers uh, to locate, um, to, to make that all feasible. So um, I, I am still optimistic. I hope that we can still come to an agreement uh, I was very happy to hear what Speaker Grassley had to say. And I know that there are some Republicans on the side of, of coming up with a solution. So um, I don't think it's going to be the whole bottle bill we want. I think there are a lot more things uh, that we need to do. But, uh, but I think that, um, that there could be some positive movement yet this session. Thank you, Representative Bohannon. Representative Masher? Thank you. And um, Linda, I want to start off by thanking you. Um, you have done an amazing job with all of the background work on the bottle bill. Um, you're probably one of the most knowledgeable people in Johnson County, if not in the state, in terms of the um, or you know how it originated and where we are today, and then promoting how we can continue to work on it to make it work better. And right now, um, we're seeing a reduction in the amount of cans and bottles that are being uh, basically recycled and 
uh, redeemed because we have not upgraded the bill. And so it is my hope and my belief that there will be something done this year. And I say that pretty confidently because the discussions have been going on since before session and all of the players have been at the table, inclu including our consumer advocate groups. And uh, again, I don't see this ever being done away with. I think consumers like it too much. And I think the public knows that this is something that's really supported by Iowans. And uh, so having said that, one of the things that I think is most important in the bill that is being discussed is that there would have to be contracts with redemption centers by all entities who sell canned and bottled beverages. And so it's a situation right now where Costco and Dollar Store and all of those do not take back cans and bottles. They won't have a in the future. They will be required to contract with the redemption center, which will help the redemption centers. It's kind of interesting. They're worried that they're going to be able to set their price. Well, they should be able to set their price, right? They're the ones taking the cans and bottles back. And uh, again, we know there's a lot of money in the unredeemed cans and bottles. And right now, the distributors are reaping the benefit from that that's going to stop too. And those are the kind of things that I think are good consumer protection pieces in the bill. So I'm excited about it. I believe there is a hope that this will happen this year and I'm going to stay positive. So there. Thank you, Representative Masher. Uh, Representative Jacoby. I think Joe might have been ahead of me, but I'll, oh, be, all right. uh, I'll be very brief. Uh, I share Mary's optimism. Uh, I'm concerned that consumers are getting nickeled and dimed to death. Oops, I'm sorry, we're just getting nickeled to death. We're not getting dimed to death. And some people wish we were. But uh, I share her optimism. My concern right now is the number of people during a pandemic who just want to know where to take their cans back and it's a, and bottles, and it's a struggle right now. And so consumers are my number one uh, concern. Thank you. Uh, Senator Bolcom. Thank you. Well, I'm optimistic because it's going to be sunny tomorrow in Iowa and we're going to be able to get outside and get some fresh air and some vitamin D. Um, I, I, want to I want to go back to the last question. Senator Kinney gave us a little bit of uh, background on some of the work he's done on, in, the, in the criminal justice area, which is his broad area. He works constantly to improve ideas, improve bills, kill, don't tell anybody, kill bills. Um, and it, 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 I would just say it's really underappreciated probably by most people, the work he does to make things better. And I just want to, I just want to note that because I see it and I want people to know it. Um, the, the Republicans control the agenda. They, they will control what happens with the bottle bill. It is in the process of unraveling. If they do not do something in the next five weeks to shore it up and stop the stop the hemorrhage, this thing it, it, we will not have a bottle bill when we come back to session in a year. Uh, we talked earlier about the mobile home bill. Uh, they have control over whether people that live in mobile homes are going to have any rights. They also have a hundred percent control over whether they're going to fix this. And I know we, we use the word we a lot, we are going to do this, or we have, are going to do that. And my colleagues have excellent ideas for making this bottle bill better. They are going to do whatever they're going to do based on what the lobby tells them they can do. And so I think people should keep the, we should keep the pressure on them. The grocers have thumbed their nose at this thing. They're not, they're not taking cans or bottles just because they don't want to. There's no penalty for it. If we allow this to go on without somehow figuring out a way to bolster independent third-party collection, the wheels are going to fall off this, and it's going to be their fault. They are really, when, when, if you need something broken or wrecked, these folks are excellent at it. Building things and creating things has not been their forte. Thank you so much. And thanks to each of you, those with questions and our legislators 
for such an informative session today. And I will just say it's, you know, it gives me hope to know that there are people like you working on our behalf because sometimes, you know, you feel like there's no hope. <laughs> um, so even though, you know, everything doesn't get passed the way maybe some of you would like, um, I'm just grateful that you're there working hard. Thank you very much. We also want to thank all of our co-sponsors, Hawkeye Chapter of the ACLU, Johnson County Affordable Housing Coalition, Johnson County Interfaith Coalition, Iowa Shares, and to the local television staff for filming this event and live streaming it on the League's Facebook page. Rebroadcasts of this forum will be run on Iowa City Channel 4 and Coral Vision. See their respective websites for programming schedules. Thank you all so much and have a good rest of your day. Looking for the sunshine tomorrow. Thank you.